All right. Uh, good evening. My name is Natasha Shu. I'm the Community Outreach and Relations for Barton Health, and I'm super pleased to welcome Dr. Kathleen Haloida. She's going to give us a nice um, presentation on breast reconstruction. Um, if you have questions that come up throughout her presentation, feel free to enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can also enter it into the chat if you prefer it that way. Um, but I'll help facilitate Q&A at the end and make sure that um, all the questions you have get asked. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Haloida. Thanks so much. Great. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your time and your interest in breast reconstruction. Um, as Natasha said, I'm Dr. Haloida. I'm a board eligible plastic and reconstructive surgeon who just joined Barton Health recently, and I'm here to begin this exciting service line. Um, so I'm very excited to discuss the various options for breast reconstruction that are available, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, however, I think there's some important introductory material that I have to go over. So these are some of the topics I would like to address this evening. As she said, just enter your questions as you have them, and I will be happy to address them at the end. Uh, so it's important to note that this review of breast cancer is in no way compre comprehensive, um, but I think it's very important to understanding breast reconstruction and how breast cancer treatment affects breast reconstruction options. Um, I thought this was an appropriate topic as October was Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but we should always be aware and thinking about breast cancer. It's very important. Uh, after skin cancer, it is the most common cancer that affect women in the United States. One out of eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. This is approximately a 12% chance in someone who doesn't have a strong family history. There are a number of factors that contribute to the development of unregulated growth of the breast, also known as breast cancer. These include lifestyle risk factors that can be modified. Um, all of these kind of go back to one central theme that breast tissue is responsive to circulating um, hormones in the body. These include estrogen and progesterone. Essentially, um, the breasts respond to increasing levels of estrogen and increasing levels of estrogen in the body throughout various life stages contribute to increased risks of breast cancer. Um, it's also why women can experience breast symptoms during menstruation or during menopause as these hormone levels change in the body. So alcohol consumption is directly related to the, related to the risk of breast cancer. The more alcohol someone consumes, the higher the risk of breast cancer. Again, this is a complex relationship that involves an increase in circulating estrogen as a result of the alcohol consumption. After menopause, the ovaries stop producing estrogen and the majority comes from adipose or fat tissue. So this increased estrogen level from excess fat in the setting of obesity uh, is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. On that same line, regular exercise reduces the risk of breast cancer, particularly after menopause. As a result, the American Cancer Society recommends 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every week. When women have children after the age of 30, or they do not have children, it increases the number of menstrual cycles that occur. This recurrent spike in estrogen stimulates the receptors in the breast tissue and can result in an increased risk of breast cancer. Similarly, non-breastfeeding uh, after childbirth leads to the return of menstrual cycles earlier after pregnancy. So by not breastfeeding, a woman increases the number of cycles she experiences and increases her risk of breast cancer. Um, and finally, any form of exogenous hormone, such as birth control pills, progesterone birth control shots, hormone releasing implants, IUDs, or hormone replacement therapy after menopause can contribute to an increased risk in breast cancer. In addition to the modifiable risk factors, there are biologic risk factors that increase a woman's chance of uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. These include being female at birth, age greater than 55, and genetic mutations that actually account for five to 10% of all breast cancer diagnoses. The most well-known of these um, include BRCA1 and BRCA2. In normal cells, these genes help make proteins that repair damaged DNA. This is an important group because while it makes up 
10% of breast cancer diagnoses, BRCA women carry a 70% lifetime risk of breast cancer, and it's more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age. They also have risk of other cancers, including ovarian and pancreatic cancer. There are ways to reduce the risk of breast and ovarian cancers in BRCA positive women. Um, unfortunately, these require surgery. Bilateral prophylactic mastectomy can provide a 90 to 95% risk reduction in breast cancer when this is accompanied with a prophylactic bilateral salpingo oophorectomy or removal of both fallopian tubes and ovaries. This can contribute to an improved survival in these patients as well. Obviously, the removal of the fallopian tubes and ovaries must be balanced with the patient's desire to have children. Um, while BRCA1 and 2 are the most well-known, there are other genetic mutations that can increase the risk of breast, breast cancer, all of which generally involve the repair of damaged DNA, and these include ATM, TP53, CHECK2, P10, CDH1, STK11, and PALB2. Finally, a personal history of um, a woman who has uh, a benign condition of the breast can increase the risk of breast cancer. All of these conditions involved increased cellular growth, so that makes sense that it contributes to unregulated growth or breast cancer. And these include ductal hyperplasia, a fibroadenoma, sclerosing adenosis, papillomatosis or multiple papillomas in the breast, radial scar, which presents um, as calcifications on mammography, atypical ductal, ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, lobular carcinoma in situ or LCIS, and then ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS, which is actually a pre-malignant lesion and needs to be treated on its own. We finish our non-modifiable risk factors with race. Um, Younger than age 45, African American women are more likely to develop breast cancer. Over the age of 45, Caucasian women are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer, while Asian, Hispanic, and Native American women have an overall lower risk of developing breast cancer. Taller women, for some reason, have an increased risk of developing breast cancer. Um, and then as we've already discussed, women with increasing amounts of circulating estrogens, so those who have an increased number of menstru menstrual cycles are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. This includes women with early menarche and late menopause. Um, radiation therapy is a wonderful tool to help with local regional control of many kinds of cancers, including breast, thyroid, and lung. Uh, we're going to harp on radio, uh, radiation therapy quite a bit when we talk about breast reconstruction. So it's important to know that radiation changes the physiology of all the cells that it contacts with, comes into contact with for the life of the patient. And this changed physiology to the chest carries an increased risk of breast cancer. And finally, from 1938 to 1971, women were given diethyl stilbestrol or DES while they were pregnant to prevent miscarriage, premature labor, and other pregnancy complications. Um, DES is a synthetic form of estrogen. It's no longer available, but it carried an increased risk of cancer, both in the women who received it and unfortunately in the daughters that they were carrying. So given these many risk factors for breast cancer, it's crucial to note that it can present in a variety of ways. It can present as a palpable mass, with skin dimpling, with changes in the skin texture or color, with nipple changes or tethering, or nipple discharge. For this reason, self-breast exams help to uh, identify some of these presentations. That being said, some can be completely asymptomatic and present only on mammography. The American Cancer Society recommends annual mammograms for women ages 45 to 54, and every other year for women older than 55. So women 40 to 44 have the choice to begin annual breast screening depending upon their risk factors. If you find that you fit into one of these age groups and you haven't received your mammogram, please be sure to contact your primary care provider and get that set up. Mammograms truly do save lives. So in order to understand how breast reconstruction fits into the treatment of breast cancer, we'll now review a little bit of breast cancer treatment itself. So the diagnosis of breast uh, and treatment of breast cancer takes an entire team of physicians and supporting medical professionals. Once someone has a diagnosis of breast cancer, the team obviously includes you, the patient, 
a radiation oncologist who uses radiation to treat breast cancer, your breast surgeon who performs surgery to treat the breast cancer, medical oncology who uses chemotherapy and a hormonal therapy, therapy to treat the breast cancer, your plastic and reconstructive surgeon who specializes in reconstructing the breast, and then a whole horse, host of supporting members of the team, including social workers, nurses, physical therapists, and support groups to help understand and deal with the diagnosis of breast cancer. There are two um, main surgical treatment paradigms for breast cancer. There's breast conserving surgery and mastectomy. Breast conserving surgery may also be called a lumpectomy, a quadrantectomy, a partial mastectomy, or a segmental mastectomy. During this surgery, only part of the breast tissue is removed. The goal is to remove the cancer as well as some surrounding normal tissue. How much of the breast is removed depends upon the tumor location as well as its size. Breast conserving therapy, uh, surgery is usually accompanied by adjuvant radiation to reduce the risk of local regional recurrence. Mastectomy is a surgery in which all breast tissue is removed. So what surgical treatment of breast cancer is right for me? This is an important discussion to have with your breast surgeon. Many women with earlier stage cancers may choose breast conserving surgery because it allows women to keep most of the breast. As I mentioned, radiation is usually a part of this therapy. And as I've discussed, it's important to note that the physiology of all tissues exposed to radiation changes for the life of the patient. So this includes the remaining skin and breast tissue that is irradiated. This can lead to significant tanning of the skin and decreased volume of the breast itself, leading to asymmetry. Some women also are not even candidates for breast conserving surgery due to the type of cancer, the size of tumor, or the previous treatments to the breast. The first and most common place for breast cancer to spread is into the lymph nodes of the axilla or the armpit. There are multiple levels of lymph nodes, and these are defined by their relation to the pectoralis minor muscle. There are two main types of surgery to remove axillary lymph nodes in the setting of breast cancer. These include the sentinel lymph node biopsy and the axillary lymph node dissection. A sentinel lymph node biopsy identifies the lymph nodes that are first in line to drain the breast, and it examines these first in line for any evidence of cancer. Only a few lymph nodes are removed in sentinel lymph node biopsy, usually about three to five. An axillary lymph node dissection is a procedure that is much more extensive and many lymph nodes are removed from the armpit. This is required in only certain clinical settings. So depending on the size, location, and type of breast cancer, additional treatment may be necessary um, in addition to surgery. These therapies may influence a patient's choice of breast reconstruction, as well as the timing of breast reconstruction. These additional therapies can include chemotherapy, which can be administered before or after surgical treatment and can affect wound healing, hormonal therapy, depending on the receptor status of the breast cancer, and radiation therapy. And this is why breast cancer treatment involves an entire team of physicians as well as support. I apologize that this picture is not of the highest quality, um, but I wanted to have a special note about radiation therapy here, because again, it's gonna come up a lot when I talk about breast reconstruction. Um, radiation therapy is a great tool to help with local and regional control of breast cancer, but it can also negatively affect the healthy tissue surrounding the breast cancer. Here we can see a pretty dramatic negative effect of radiation. The skin is tan in an exact square, which is the exact radiation field. The skin also becomes very fibrotic or scarred and has a significant difficulty healing in the future. Also, gravity will never affect a radiated breast the same as it will an irradiated breast. Um, so that's something that I have to think, consider in breast reconstruction. Also in the setting of radiation, you can have a significant decrease in volume um, of the remaining breast tissue and these changes can be lifelong. Um, now, before we get into the details of breast reconstruction, I want to talk about an important piece of legislation called the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998. Um, this law is important and very relevant to breast cancer because it is a federal law that provides protections to patients who choose to have breast reconstruction surgery 
following mastectomy, and it applies to all types of health insurance plans. Um, it, the law states that insurance must cover all stages of breast reconstruction, all symmetry procedures, and all prosthetics. It also states that um, any complications from breast cancer treatment must be covered by insurance as well. Um, so symmetry procedures are those that are actually performed on the contralateral breast or the non-breast cancer side. Examples of these include a reduction, a mastopexy, or a breast lift, or even a breast augmentation. Um, prosthetics are a less popular option, but they include bras that contain a silicone prosthetic that could be worn in place of breast reconstruction surgery. And then finally, some um, one important complication that can arise is lymphedema, um, which I want to talk about briefly at the end of this talk. Uh, one thing that is important to note about the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act is that it does not include specific time frame limitations. So breast reconstruction may be pursued years following treatment for breast cancer. Now, before we get into the different methods of breast reconstruction, why would anybody ever consider breast reconstruction? After all, it's an elective surgery, so it's not technically medically necessary and it may come with its own set of complications. Um, to address this, I start every breast reconstruction consultation visit the exact same way. I explain that as a patient, you might meet me, think I'm a nice enough person, but breast reconstruction is more surgery and more stress than I can handle, in which case I get it. Breast reconstruction is optional. At the time of treatment for breast cancer, there are many things going on. One, there's a recent diagnosis of breast cancer, usually. Two, um, the patient is dealing with the fact that you may be losing your breast. And three, people who are receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy are you dealing with the side effects caused by those medications. So it's important to note that your plastic and reconstructive surgeon is never, our goal is to never interfere with the cancer treatment. I am here for support, to provide information, and hopefully to make patients feel whole again, those that choose to pursue breast reconstruction. As far as the plastic surgery literature is concerned regarding breast reconstruction, the benefits include a short-term and long-term psychological benefit for women who elect to undergo these procedures. It also eliminates the need for those external breast prosthetics, which I mentioned are not incredibly popular. It avoids clothing limitations and helps women regain a sense of femininity and wholeness. On the other hand, some women completely decline breast reconstruction because they fear the complications, they believe that they are too old, or they fear it will interfere with their cancer treatment and surveillance. There are two different classification systems that we use to discuss our algorithm for breast reconstruction. The first classification system deals with timing. So we'll begin by discussing um, immediate versus delayed breast reconstruction. Immediate breast reconstruction, meaning a procedure that is performed at the same time as the mastectomy, has its advantages and disadvantages. Advantages to immediate breast reconstruction allows for a better cosmetic result because all of the anatomic landmarks of the breast are preserved, as is most of the skin of the breast. The most important anatomic landmark is the inframammary fold, where the breast meets the chest wall. Um, this can become scarred down when delayed breast reconstruction is performed and its landmark is generally lost. Also, following immediate breast reconstruction, a woman never has to experience being completely flat, so there are psychological benefits to the immediate breast reconstruction. Even if a tissue expander is placed, which I'll discuss, a small breast mound is appreciated. Clearly, there are also disadvantages to immediate breast reconstruction. Um, these include difficulty in assessing mastectomy skin flap viability. As you can imagine, when all of the lovely breast tissue is removed during a mastectomy, it has been present along with its blood supply in a certain arrangement for long or as long as the patient has been alive. So when we take away all this underlying support and blood supply to this thin breast skin, there may be an issue with the viability of the skin during immediate breast reconstruction because we're counting on a very superficial blood supply that's coming from the periphery. Um, in the setting of post-operative radiation therapy, this can negatively affect the appearance of the breast reconstruction. In order to mitigate that slightly, usually a staged approach is performed. 
Um, and if there are any complications with immediate breast reconstruction, another disadvantage is that it can delay chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Delayed breast reconstruction carries its own advantages and disadvantages. We see here delayed breast reconstruction with implant technique and with bilateral free flaps. With delayed breast reconstruction, there's no delay in postoperative chemotherapy or radiation. Delayed breast reconstruction also carries a lower complication rate. If radiation therapy is needed, damaged skin can actually be removed at the time of breast reconstruction and replaced with healthy tissue. We can appreciate that here. Again, I apologize. Some of my photos didn't come through very well. Um, on the patient's left breast, where the irradiated and tan skin has been mainly removed and replaced with a free flap. So the physiology, physiologic changes of radiation therapy have still been present and are still affecting that skin and underlying muscle. And it's nice to be able to replace it with healthy, non-irradiated tissue to help kind of reverse some of those changes. Disadvantages of delayed breast reconstruction include loss of the original shape of the breast, as I mentioned. That's one of the advantages of immediate. Um, there's also the stress of living with a mastectomy defect like this for a given period of time. Uh, so the second way that we just classify breast reconstruction is based on the actual materials used for the breast reconstruction. And here we're really going to get into some of the techniques that we can use to reconstruct the breast mound. So first we'll discuss breast uh, implant-based breast reconstruction, which is the most common form of breast reconstruction in the United States. Overall, um, implant-based breast reconstruction has no additional morbidity or scarring when compared with the mastectomy itself, and it involves a far shorter operative time and recovery time compared to autologous-based breast reconstruction. The surgery for implant-based reconstruction is either outpatient or a one-night stay in the hospital. Complications can include infection, because we're using a foreign body, extrusion of the implant, or mastectomy skin flap necrosis. Over time, capsular contracture or hardening of the tissues around the implant itself may be a reason for revi uh, revision operations in the future. And then finally, again, the implant is a foreign body. It's under warranty for a certain number of uh, years, but it may rupture. And if this happens, the implant will need to be removed and replaced in the future. The placement for breast reconstruction uh, implants has actually changed very recently in plastic surgery. Most commonly, the implant is placed under the pectoralis major muscle as shown here on the left. This provides additional protection for the implant. Um, as we discussed at the time of mastectomy, all the lovely breast tissue is gone here, so the skin is all that remains. And in some women, the skin um, may be extremely thin and unable to support an implant on its own. So recently, there's been a trend to place the breast reconstruction implant in the prepectoral plane, um, as shown here. After all, the breast tissue was initially superficial to the muscle, so the implant will be placed in that exact same plane. Uh, we still need to have a few more long-term studies to see the longitudinal results and make sure that the breast is preserved in its correct location using this technique. So in order to provide more support for the mastectomy skin and to help protect our breast reconstruction from the outside world, a substance called acellular dermal matrix or ADM is used in conjunction with implant-based breast reconstruction. This material works to keep the implant in the correct place and functions as kind of an internal bra for the patient. ADM is actually cadaver skin that has been de-epithelialized, so the superficial most layer of skin has been completely removed. Um, all the cells in the remaining dermis are also removed, so the substance is completely inert. Um, it eventually does incorporate into the patient's body and is you can't tell the difference between it and the mastectomy skin. So when the implant is placed below the muscle, as we see here, the ADM acts as a sling by creating the inframammary fold and connecting the pec muscle to the chest wall. This helps to maintain the initial anatomy of the breast. When the implant is placed in the prepectoral plane, as shown here, the ADM completely covers the implant and supports it in all planes. 
So I've spoken how the mastectomy skin flaps have the potential to be thin and possibly a poor blood supply. One way to ensure happy, healthy mastectomy skin flaps is to perform breast reconstruction in a staged fashion. Now, this would mean that immediate breast reconstruction would be performed with a device called a tissue expander, as shown here. This is actually the exact same type that I use. A tissue expander is a surgical balloon that occupies the same space as the future breast implant or possible flap. At the time of mastectomy, the tissue expander is placed and filled with a small amount of normal saline. The uh, amount of volume that can be placed depends on the healthiness of the skin flaps. And then we balance getting as much volume into the tissue expander as possible while not putting too much excess stress on the skin flap. There is a metal backed port as seen here uh, where a needle can be inserted to fill the tissue expander and that prevents us from popping the surgical balloon. After the initial placement of the tissue expander, patient returns to our clinic. After healing from the mastectomy and initial tissue expander placement, tissue expansion begins in clinic three weeks after that initial procedure. We inject more and more saline into the tissue expander once or twice per week until the patient is happy with the volume that we have achieved. So in photo A, we see a preoperative photo. In panel B, the patient has filled the tissue expanders to her desired volume. And then once that volume has been reached, this tissue expander will stay in for a minimum of four to six weeks, allowing the skin to stretch and heal and be healthy when the tissue expander is replaced. Here we see the final result of implant-based breast reconstruction. This woman in particular had a little bit of ptosis, um, so they actually did a different mastectomy pattern, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. So if chemotherapy or radiation are needed for cancer treatment, these are performed while the tissue expanders are in place and are filled to the patient's desired volume. So after the completion of chemotherapy and radiation, we'll wait three to six months in order to let the body heal um, and the physiology of the remaining tissue to change in response to radiation therapy. In the setting of no radiation, tissue expander may be simply replaced with a breast implant, as we saw here. However, in a patient like this one, if we simply replaced a tissue expander with an implant on this left side, the risk of infection and loss of implant would be far too great. However, this patient is still a candidate for implant-based breast reconstruction. It just requires an additional step. Like in that previous patient, if radiation is required and the patient still wants to take advantage of a shorter recovery time associated with breast implant, breast reconstruction, a latissimus dorsi musculocutaneous flap is indicated. The lat muscle is a superficial muscle in the back uh, whose function is to adduct the arm against the body, medially rotate and extend the arm posteriorly. By bringing healthy tissue in the form of a non-irradiated musculocutaneous flap or a flap that contains both muscle and skin um, in front to the breast helps protect the breast implant reconstruction from infection and also from failure. The tissue brings its own blood supply, the thoracodorsal, thoracodorsal artery and vein, which is robust and helps to counter the physiologic changes that we appreciate with radiation therapy. So the volume of the lat is usually not sufficient to reconstruct an entire breast. That's why it's usually used in combination with implant-based breast reconstruction in the setting of radiation. I'm sure everyone is thinking, well, don't I need my lat muscle? What happens when you move it to a different part of my body? That is an excellent question. Um, initially, patients do experience some weakness with adduction, medial rotation, and extension. However, at one year, studies have shown that the difference in strength between the harvested side and the unaffected side are not appreciated. Um, there are a few special populations that do still notice the difference in strength long term, and these include professional rock climbers, competitive rowers, and competitive swimmers. It doesn't mean that you cannot participate in these, but that is the population that does notice the missing lat. Uh, an additional possible morbidity of a lat flap is that the space that was once occupied by this muscle likes to fill up with fluid. 
I like to explain it that when you sprain your ankle and it fills up with that boggy fluid, this is an inflammatory healing fluid. And surgery is just a huge, intense sprain. And the body's natural tendency is to fill any space with that same healing inflammatory fluid. So drains are placed in the back to help prevent the um, formation of a seroma or a collection of fluid. These drains are removed when the volume is adequately low. Despite this, if a seroma does form, uh, it's drained in the clinic and usually the patient just needs to wear a compression device until it is resolved. So as a plastic surgeon, when creating a breast mound, out of tissue that is normally located elsewhere, I am always considering the morbidity or the downside of removing tissue from one area and putting it in another. Um, so certain techniques have been developed to help decrease morbidity involved in breast reconstruction. And the final type of breast reconstruction I'm gonna discuss is autologous or free flap breast reconstruction. Free flap breast reconstruction is essentially a transplant operation within a single patient. So tissue is removed from one area of the body along with its blood supply, as we can see here, and it is sutured to recipient vessels in another part of the body. The most common free flap procedure performed for breast reconstruction is the deep inferior epigastric perforator or deep flap. This flap involves finding the perforators that travel through the rectus abdominis muscles and following to their source blood vessel, the deep inferior epigastric artery. We then follow that artery down into the pelvis and trace it to its source vessel, the external iliac artery, where we divide the deep inferior epigastric artery and remove all the tissue um, with it from the abdomen. There are variations of this abdominally based reflap. Um, some of the more common ones include the superficial inferior epigastric artery or SIEA flap as well as a muscle sparing transverse rectus abdominis myelocutaneous flap or an MS tram flap. The SIEA simply uses a different source uh, vessel to feed the flap. It usually comes out in this plane underneath here. And the muscle sparing tram simply involves taking a little bit of the rectus abdominis muscle with the deep flap itself. Once the blood vessel feeding the abdominal free flap is isolated and the flap is removed from the abdomen, blood vessels from the chest are identified and exposed in order to receive the free flap. Usually the internal mammary artery and vein are used between the third and fourth rib spaces. The donor blood vessels from the free flap are then anastomosed to the recipient blood vessels in the chest underneath a microscope. This technique is used because the blood vessels are small, only about one to three millimeters in size, and precise suture placement uh, requires this magnified view. Here we see a completed arterial and venous anastomosis. The artery is sewn by hand, and the vein can be connected using what's called a venous coupler. Um, that's because the flow is slower and the walls are very thin of the vein. Um, if this procedure sounds kind of technical, it's because it is. Um, I did an entire year of fellowship specializing in microvascular surgery. Um, the advantage of this procedure is that it does use the patient's own tissue, hence it's called autologous breast reconstruction. If a patient loses weight, the flap will get smaller with them. If they gain weight, it will grow with them. Um, the patient also gets a little bit of a tummy tuck, even though the muscles are not plicated together, all of the tissue below the umbilicus is removed and used to create the breast mound. It can also replace damaged irradiated tissue with healthy, well-vascularized tissue as we appreciated before. The primary complication that concerns me with this type of breast reconstruction is an issue with the vascular anastomoses of the free flap as demonstrated here. If there's an issue with inflow or with outflow, the flap will not survive. So 97% of these issues occur in the first three days following the operation. So clearly surveillance is critical um, following this procedure. For the first 48 hours after the procedure, the flap is checked every single hour for appropriate color, temperature, and a vascular signal. This signal is a sound that can be heard on a handheld Doppler on the flap itself. 
Um, after the first 48 hours, the flap is then checked every two hours. Two days later, we extend that out to every four hours until the patient leaves the hospital. Other complications may include something called fat necrosis. This presents as hard nodules that are palpable through the skin on the flap side. This results from a flap that is too large for the blood supply that it provided. So these nodules can either be improved with scar massage or they may need to be removed. Other complications that are, can occur, occur at the donor site. Clearly we're operating in two very different locations. So these can include seroma formation or fluid collection underneath the skin or a possible hernia. Um, the autologous breast reconstruction is a very large investment up front. It's an all day procedure in the operating room, sometimes into the night. It's a longer hospital stay compared to all the other forms of breast reconstruction and recovery takes a full eight weeks. There are other donor sites for free flat breast reconstruction besides the abdomen. These include the superior gluteal artery as pictured here. This flap will leave a scar along the superior buttock and can result in asymmetry if you're only doing one side. The transverse upper gracilis flap may also be used as demonstrated here. It's taken from the medial thigh. This flap also, if you only do one, will leave the thighs asymmetric. So both of these procedures are technically more challenging as compared to the um, abdominal free flaps but they are a good option for patients who have already had an abdominal plasty or simply um, don't have enough tissue in their abdomen. Um, for these procedures in particular, the blood supply can vary um, a little bit more compared to the abdominally based free flap. The final type of breast reconstruction that I'd like to discuss is called oncoplastic reconstruction. Now this encompasses a number of different techniques for women who undergo lumpectomy as opposed to mastectomy. It allows patients to maintain a symmetrical and aesthetic look. So when a lumpectomy is performed, it can create a little scoop or a hollow in the breast where the tissue is removed. So we can rearrange breast tissue. This is an example of a vertical reduction technique. Um, by creating a parenchymal flap to fill the space that once was occupied by tumor. Um, this is a very special kind of reconstruction. And I just wanna reiterate that the goal of the oncoplastic surgeon is not to interfere in any way with the treatment of breast cancer. So these techniques when timed correctly and done correctly um, in the setting of healthy, a uh, healthy patient can really help preserve the original shape of the breast and allow women to return to normal as quickly as possible. There are four main categories of oncoplastic breast reconstruction as listed here. The appropriate technique to use is defined by the size of the tumor, the original volume of the patient's breast, and the proposed percentage of breast removed with the lumpectomy. Oncoplastic procedures require significant planning with the breast surgeon and plastic surgeon prior to any surgical intervention. This way, surgical incisions can be planned together in order to provide the best aesthetic outcome possible. Oncoplastic procedures are performed five to 10 days after the lumpectomy. This allows pathology to determine that the entire tumor has been removed before reconstruction and possible parenchymal rearrangement is undertaken. So common techniques include wide local incision, a mastopexy or breast lift, or a breast reduction to best optimize the size and shape of the breast. Um, the patient shown here has a right-sided breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant. She underwent a lumpectomy and then uh, followed one week later by breast reduction parenchymal rearrangement to fill the defect that was left by the lumpectomy. She then underwent radiation therapy to the right breast six weeks after her lumpectomy. Six months after radiation was completed, she was able to undergo left-sided reduction for symmetry. The reason for this delay, again, is that the right, the right breast had the potential to shrink even more with radiation therapy. So the final volume was established prior to the symmetry procedure on the left. Oncoplastic reconstruction is a wonderful technique for women undergoing breast conserving therapy. The timeline keeps it safe so that we can do thorough um, cancer treatment 
allowing us to get that final pathology and allows the patient plenty of time to heal prior to any radiation or chemotherapy needs to be delivered. So all of the procedures I've discussed so far are used to create the actual breast mound and volume following mastectomy. Um, the few procedures I'm gonna go over now demonstrate ways we can refine our breast reconstruction in order to make the patient feel completely whole again. So after a patient is healed from their breast reconstruction, she may notice some asymmetry between her breasts. This may be due to radiation changes or simply because unilateral breast reconstruction was performed, so the breasts just inherently look different. I return to this patient again, who had dramatically different size and shape of breasts following her breast cancer treatment. She was able to undergo reduction on the left side. And now remember, because of the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998, even though there was no cancer on this left side, this procedure is covered by insurance because it's related to her breast cancer care. Sometimes over time with breast cancer reconstruction, irregularities can develop in the reconstructed breast, um, either hollowing or just contour irregularities. And these can be addressed with a technique called fat grafting. This procedure involves liposuction of areas with excess fat, processing this fat in the operating room, and injecting it directly into contour irregularities. We can see here there's a concavity um, of the reconstructed breast, and it doesn't have a lot of upper pole fullness. So fat was injected medially here and along the upper pole to give it a nice, uh, much nicer shape. Usually there is a 50 to 60% resorption rate with fat grafting. This is because you're physically removing fat without any blood supply, moving it to another location and just expecting it to develop its own blood supply and survive. So the final volume after one round of fat grafting is usually appreciated at three months post-operatively. It usually needs to be repeated because again, we overfill slightly um, but with that 50 to 60% resorption rate, we want to make sure that eventually you have the right contour and the right volume. So it usually has to re be repeated at least two or three times. Um, unfortunately, fat grafting does not provide adequate volume to reconstruct an entire breast just using this technique. So again, this would be considered revision of reconstructed breast and would be covered by insurance under the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 98. Finally, um, nipple reconstruction is an optional procedure for women at least six months after all revisions have been performed. That way the shape of the breast mound will be established and the nipple can be created in the optimal position. It's optional and I would say about 50% of women pursue nipple reconstruction. Options for nipple reconstruction include pasties, which are stick-on nipples that can be reused, three-dimensional tattooing, or a short procedure that I can perform in the clinic under local anesthesia as demonstrated here. Nipple reconstruction provides some projection of the nipple. It does have the um, propensity to flatten over time, unfortunately. So after the nipple reconstruction, women elect to pursue tattooing so that the nipple matches the contralateral side and so that the areola can be recreated or can be created. All right, so I'm sure you can appreciate that I could give an entire lecture on each method of breast reconstruction to truly go over every detail, um, but I look forward to answering your questions shortly. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on a complication of breast cancer treatment uh, called lymphedema, the treatment of which has evolved dramatically over the last decade with the introduction of super microsurgery. Lymphedema can occur following mastectomy and axillary lymph node dissection in the setting of breast cancer. It is a buildup of fluid in the soft tissues when the lymph lymphatic system is damaged or blocked. The delicate lymphatic channels can be damaged by axillary lymph node dissection, by radiation, or by a cancer tumor itself. Um, other causes not related to cancer include obesity or um, parasites. The number one cause of lymphedema worldwide is filariasis, which is a parasitic infection. However, in the United States, lymphedema is most commonly caused by cancer treatment, um, both in the upper extremity or the lower extremity for gynecologic or um, prostate cancer treatments in uh, men. 
So the lymphatic system is just as important as the arterial and venous systems that deliver blood to the tissues and return it to the heart. The system connects eventually, all, all of the lymphatic system connects eventually to the thoracic duct here, where it usually dumps um, into the uh, superior vena cava or the SVC. So the lymphatic system eventually drains into the venous system. When this system becomes unbalanced, lymphedema occurs, it's uncomfortable, it can limit lifestyles, and it can result in multiple episodes of severe cellulitis or life-threatening skin infections. Initially, it's important to note that non-surgical management is key. Presently, there is no cure for lymphedema. Non-surgical measures can help reduce the swelling and relieve symptoms. This is usually guided by a physical therapist who specializes in lymphedema. It's a multimodal approach that includes exercise, weight loss, compressive devices, wrapping of the effective limb, manual lymphatic drainage as demonstrated here, or a pneumatic pump, which is usually worn at night. If symptoms are severe and persist for at least three months after therapy, surgical intervention can be considered. There are two types of surgical interventions that are offered for the treatment of lymphedema. The first is called a lymphovenous bypass or LVB. Under a microscope, your surgeon would use very small interest instruments and sutures to connect blocked lymphatic channels to a nearby vein. The diameter of these lymphatic vessels may be as small as 0.3 millimeters. So this bypass allows the lymphatic lymphatic fluid to be shunted directly into the venous system and avoid more proximal obstruction, like in the armpit from axillary lymph node dissection. A vascularized lymph node transfer is again essentially a transplant operation like the autologous breast reconstruction, where we remove healthy lymph nodes with their blood supply and move them to an area that's affected by lymphedema. We can commonly take nodes from the supraclavicular region as demonstrated here, from the groin, or from the posterior thoracic lymph nodes over the serratus muscle. Lastly, and currently under investigation at a number of institutions throughout the country, is a procedure called LIMPHA, or Lymphatic Microsurgical Preventative Healing Approach. This procedure is performed at the time of mastectomy and axillary lymph node dissection, so it's done in con combination with the breast surgeon. It involves the preservation of a few lymphatic vessels, and after the removal of the lymph nodes, these lymphatic vessels are connected to a nearby vein in the axilla. So current evidence suggests that this is helpful in reducing the incidence of lymphedema following axillary lymph node dissection. Um, I hope this has been an informative session for everyone on the various types of breast reconstruction um, and all the care that we can provide following the diagnosis of breast cancer. I find that these are some of the most rewarding procedures for me. Um, I went into plastic and reconstructive surgery and to make, in order to make people feel whole again after diagnoses or trauma like this. So it's also just a very small percentage of the procedures that are offered at Barton Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And I'm very happy to be here and to be serving the community of Tahoe. So I would like to thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that may have come up. Great. Thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, I just want to remind folks that if you do have questions, you can ask them um, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen or in the chat box. We do have a couple that have come in, so um, feel free to ask those questions as we go. Um, the first is, what is the increased risk for diagnosis of LCIS? So LCIS is interesting because unlike DCIS, it is not a premalignant lesion itself. But even once it is completely removed, which is recommended, there is an increased risk of breast cancer in both breasts. Um, it's not, I mean, it is significantly higher, um, but it's not like a 10% increase. I don't know the exact number, but I can find that out. Great. Uh, the next question is, does the 1998 law cover reconstruct reconstruction due to radiation complications or only mastectomy? It does cover those related to radiation as well. 
for your breast cancer treatment. One kind of gray area, which is a little frustrating, is the lumpectomy reconstructions. But the vast I, I have never had a problem getting those cover those procedures covered at my previous institutions. Um, but it, it does specifically spell out mastectomy and radiation. Great. And this looks like our last question, but like I said, if there are any others, um, feel free to ask. But um, the question is around um, breast implants mm -hmm. and higher risk for breast cancer. And then also is it a different, um, you know, kind of treatment with breast implants? Different treatment for, oh, so for women who get them for breast augmentation? I think so. Yes. Okay. So, uh, all, all of the data suggests that breast implants do not interfere with any surveillance or detection of breast cancer. Recently, I would say in the last 10 years, there has been a large issue with a new breast, ca uh, breast cancer called breast implant associated, um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, this is associated only with textured breast implants. Um, for a very long time, we were also using textured tissue expanders because the, there would be a little bit of tissue in growth and they would stay in place better than smooth ones. Um, but again, the textured surface created enough, um, we'll call it stickiness for certain bacteria and these bacteria are associated with a very indolent, very slow growing, late presenting breast cancer that is associated with textured implants. And it presents, um, again, it's breast implant associated ALCL. Um, it's very slow growing, but it usually presents three to eight years after somebody has had a textured implant. And um, it presents as a unilateral, very swollen breast that has a seroma around it. So the treatment for that is complete capsulectomy and removal of the capsule, the seroma, and the implant all at once. Great. That answers that question. Yeah, I think I've answered answer. two different ones because I wanted to make sure. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And it actually prompted, we have a couple more questions that came in. Um, this, yeah. this one, um, this person had a bilateral mastectomy with implants prior to radiation and her <laughs> non-cancer side implant fell out of the pocket. Um, what can be done? Not Only skin is holding okay. it in. Um, so again, good news because the women's, um, health and cancer rights act of 98, it'll be covered because it'll be a symmetry procedure. Um, cause it, it's the non-cancer side. There are um, that acellular dermal matrix that I mentioned, or ADM, there are products very similar to that, that can be used to recreate the pocket and recreate the anatomy of the breast. Um, sometimes I, I've had patients come in and say, my implants are on my stomach because they slide beneath where that inframammary fold should be. So the important thing is just to recreate the inframammary fold. Great. And I think we have one more. Um, let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to ask it. Um, do you, I think they're asking if you perform the tram fl flap procedure. I do. I did an entire extra year for microvascular surgery. Um, there is, there's a procedure, there's the pedicled tram flap as well, um, which carries a much higher morbidity and is actually kind of falling out of favor. So I don't do the pedicled, which involves, um, let's see if I can, I'm better, I'm a very visual learner. So if I can just bear with me for one moment. So what the tram flap is, is this muscle is, would be taken the right side to reconstruct the left breast. The pedicle may, remains attached up here and you simply tunnel it there. And they were finding very high hernia rates with that procedure. And there's also a little bit of a contour irregularity in the subcutaneous tissue where it's being ooh, tunneled up to the breast. So I don't do pedicle tram, but I do the free deep free muscle sparing tram procedures. 
Great. I, I hope I asked that question correctly. Um, and we did get one more. Um, are there different sizes of expanders? Yes. The ex I during your preoperative visit, I do measurements of base width, breast height, intramammary distance, all these things um, that will define what size tissue expander to place. And then we use a system to match the expander to the appropriate implant size. Wonderful. Well, I, I think that's all the questions we um, we got for tonight. I'll just remind folks um, on this presentation, we will have this uploaded to our YouTube and it's on our Facebook and you can learn more about, about Dr. Haloida and her new practice on our website, bartonhealth.org. Um, but just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here tonight, Dr. Haloida, and we hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. Thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, sorry. And we did, um, I do believe Dr. Helena is taking new patients. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, I believe so. So you can find her information on our website. Thank you so much. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, everybody.